A causal theory of reference is a theory of how terms acquire specific reference. Such theories have been used to describe many referring terms, particularly logical terms, proper names, and natural kind terms. In the case of names, for example, a causal theory of reference typically involves the following claims. A name's referent is fixed by an original act of naming, whereupon the name becomes a rigid designator of that object. Later uses of the name succeed in referring to the referent by being linked to that original act via a causal chain. Weaker versions of the position claim merely that, in many cases, events in the causal history of a speaker's use of the term, including when the term was first acquired, must be considered to correctly assign references to the speaker's words. Causal theories of names became popular during the 1970s, under the influence of work by Sol Kripke and Keith Dinellon. Kripke and Hilary Putnam also defended an analogous causal account of natural kind terms. Kripke's causal account of names in lectures later published his Naming and Necessity, Kripke provided a rough outline of his causal theory of reference for names. Although he refused to explicitly endorse such a theory, he indicated that such an approach was far more promising than the then popular descriptive theory of names introduced by Russell, according to which names are in fact disguised definite descriptions. Kripke argued that in order to use a name successfully to refer to something, you do not have to be acquainted with a uniquely identifying description of that thing. Rather, your use of the name need only be caused by the naming of that thing. Such a causal process might proceed as follows. The parents of a newborn baby name it, pointing to the child and saying, We'll call her Jane, henceforth everyone calls her Jane. With that act, the parents give the girl her name. The assembled family and friends now know that Jane is a name which refers to Jane. This is referred to as Jane's dubbing, naming, or initial baptism. However, not everyone who knows Jane and uses the name of Jane to refer to her was present at this naming. So how is it that when they use the name Jane, they are referring to Jane? The answer provided by causal theories is that there is a causal chain that passes from the original observers of Jane's naming to everyone else who uses her name. For example, maybe Jill was not at the naming, but Jill learns about Jane, and learns that her name is Jane, from Jane's mother, who was there. She then uses the name of Jane, with the intention of referring to the child Jane's mother referred to. Jill can now use the name of, and her use of it can in turn transmit the ability to refer to Jane to other speakers. Philosophers such as Gareth Evans have insisted that the theory's account of the dubbing process needs to be broadened to include what are called multiple groundings. After her initial baptism, uses of Jane in the presence of Jane may, under the right circumstances, be considered to further ground the name in its referent. That is, if I am in direct contact with Jane, the reference for my utterance of the name Jane may be fixed not simply by a causal chain through people who had encountered her earlier. It may also be indexically fixed to Jane at the moment of my utterance. Thus our modern-day use of a name such as Christopher Columbus's can be thought of as referring to Columbus through a causal chain that terminates not simply in one instance of his naming, but rather in a series of grounding uses of the name that occurred throughout his life. Under certain circumstances of confusion, this can lead to the alteration of a name's referent. Motivation Causal theories of reference were born partially in response to the widespread acceptance of Russellian descriptive theories. Russell found that certain logical contradictions could be avoided if names were considered disguised definite descriptions. On such an account, the name Aristotle might be seen as meaning the student of Plato and teacher of Alexander the Great. Later description theorists expanded upon this by suggesting that a name expressed not one particular description, but many, or a weighted average of these descriptions. Kripke found this account to be deeply flawed, for a number of reasons. Notably, 
We can successfully refer to individuals for whom we have no uniquely identifying description. We can successfully refer to individuals for whom the only identifying descriptions we have failed to refer as we believe them to. We use names to speak hypothetically about what could have happened to a person. A name functions as a rigid designator, while a definite description does not. A causal theory avoids these difficulties. A name refers rigidly to the bearer to which it is causally connected, regardless of any particular facts about the bearer, and in all possible worlds. The same motivations apply to causal theories in regard to other sorts of terms. Putnam, for instance, attempted to establish that water refers rigidly to the stuff that we do in fact call water, to the exclusion of any possible identical water-like substance for which we have no causal connection. These considerations motivate semantic externalism, because speakers interact with a natural kind such as water regularly and because there is generally no naming ceremony through which their names are formalized. The multiple groundings described above are even more essential to a causal account of such terms. A speaker whose environment changes may thus observe that the reference of his terms shift, as described in the twin earth and swamp man thought experiments. Criticisms of the theory Gareth Evans argued that the causal theory, or at least certain common and over simple variants of it, have the consequence that, however remote or obscure the causal connection between someone's use of a proper name and the object it originally referred to, they still refer to that object when they use the name. The theory effectively ignores context and makes reference into a magic trick. Evans describes it as a photograph theory of reference. The links between different users of the name are particularly obscure. Each user must somehow pass the name on to the next, and must somehow mean the right individual as they do so. Kripke himself notes the difficulty. John Searle makes much of it. Mark Sainsbury argued for a causal theory similar to Kripke's, except that the baptized object is eliminated. A baptism may be a baptism of nothing, he argues. A name can be intelligibly introduced even if it names nothing. The causal chain we associate with the use of proper names may begin merely with a journalistic source. The causal theory has a difficult time explaining the phenomenon of reference change. Gareth Evans cites the example of when Marco Polo unknowingly referred to the African island as Madagascar when the natives actually used the term to refer to a part of the mainland. Evans claims that Polo clearly intended to use the term as the natives do, but somehow changed the meaning of the term Madagascar to refer to the island as it is known today. Michael Devitt claims that repeated groundings in an object can account for reference change. However, such a response leaves open the problem of cognitive significance that originally intrigued Russell and Frager. East Asians are more likely than Americans to have intuitions about reference in line with descriptivist theories.